Welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Marilyn Turkovich, Executive Director of the Charter for Compassion. Just a week ago, um, the Charter recognized the Parent Circle um, uh, Family Forum as being one of our 2021 humanitarian awardees. Um, it was a wonderful expression of gratitude that we did that. Um, the family circle has been very, the parent circle has been really close um, to our work. Uh, Roby Demelon, who you will be meeting shortly, is part of our Global Compassion Council. Uh, people that are extraordinary in the work that they do around the world uh, to bring about peace and reconciliation, forgiveness, um, and we are really very honored to have three people uh, from the parent circle here with us today. And so I am going to invite you as you listen and have ideas, reflections and questions to please put them in the chat and make certain that you either make those reflections and questions to either the host and the panelists or to everyone uh, who might be on the program. Uh, so without much more on, on the way of what we're saying from the Charter for Compassion, uh, I'd like to introduce Anita Silbert uh, from the Parent Circle, and she will be telling you a little bit about the background, and then we'll move forward with listening to Roby and Lila. Anita? Your mic is yep, got it. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I'm very glad to be here this morning here in Chicago, wherever the rest of you all are. Um, uh, I've been with the Parent Circle for not quite a year, so whatever I'm sure Robbie and Lila can fill you in on the history of the organization better than I. But basically, about 25 years ago, it was started to uh, start to bridge the. Um, break down the wall between Palestinians and Israelis um, in that uh, the, the membership of this organization is one that no one, we don't want any more members of this organization because they are all bereaved families who have lost someone in the conflict over the years. And these, uh, these members have make and made some incredibly brave choices and, and they will tell you about them as they tell their stories. Um, some of the things that the parent circle does uh, is, is what you would be, what we are hoping you will be uh, in, um, intrigued by and, and, and want to support the work that we do. The dialogue meetings are meant to just bring the messages and the and the, the the stories of people because when you start hearing stories one by one by one, it puts a human face on this far beyond whatever the news stories could tell you, and and that's what will bring us further to turning away from violence and revenge. Um, there are every year there is a summer camp for teenagers, both Palestinian and Israeli teenagers that we run, um, that brings these kids together in a way that can break down the, the walls between them too. For a lot of these kids, uh, for a lot of Israelis and Palestinians, the, the Palestinians haven't met anybody who wasn't a soldier and the Israelis have never met any Palestinians who weren't, uh, you know, sweeping floors or something. So this really makes the other side very, very human. And that's the goal. Um, so the summer camp, it happens every year for these teenagers. Uh, there is a Memorial Day ceremony that happens every year, uh, the day after Yom Hazikaron, the Memorial Day in Israel. And last year, I heard, uh, I read that there were over a quarter of a million people who logged on to this worldwide. It is a remarkable event, and uh, we are proud to host it every single year. Uh, the other things that Parent Circle does include a women's group. Uh, so the women of parents, our members can get together and share things that bring them together. Uh, and the same thing goes with the various, the dual narrative. You know, we, 
we are used to seeing the world and our issues through our own narrative. And it is incredibly helpful to have the lens into somebody else's narrative so we can move forward uh, and out of our very rigid little places that we've been living in. Uh, that's some of the, that are some of the things that Parent Circle does. And we are very, very happy that you've invited us here to learn more about the organization, but especially, especially to listen to Ravi and Lila who will tell you their stories and, and how they came to do what they do. So I hear the coin toss ended on Lila to go first. <laughs> so I would like to bring you to Lila Al Sheikh, one of our lovely, wonderful, wonderful members of Parent Circle. Thank you, Anita. I'm so glad to be here today to talk to you. And first of all, I wanna say happy holidays to everyone who's celebrating now. Um, as Anita said, my name is Leila Sheikh. I'm from a village near Bethlehem. Uh, I was born in Jordan. My parents originally from Bethlehem, but uh, my parents went to Jordan because my father was a teacher and he went there to teach the refugees in the camps. Uh, but after that, the war was started in 1967. And at that time, the Israeli government took a decision not to allow them to come back again, and they lost their citizenship as Palestinian, and they become Jordanian. So me and my brothers and sisters were born in Jordan. Um, my father always told us about Palestine and about his childhood and about the places that he went and about his family who stay here. So for all my life, I was dreamed to come back and live again here. Um, I really love it so much because my father always told us about it. So I met my husband after I finished my studying captain business in Jordan and he's originally from Bethlehem. Uh, 1999, I came to Bethlehem to, um, to get married and um, to stay here. The first year was amazing. Everything was like my father said. I tried to went to every places and tried to meet his family who live here. So I was really so happy and our happiness become much more when we have our first uh, daughter. And um, we start to think that the life will be so beautiful forever. But unfortunately, after two months, the second uprising was started. And it was the first time I lived in, in a crazy situation like that. And I, I was hope that this will end, but unfortunately every day become much more harder and harder. And at that time, the Israeli government take uh, a decision not to allow to give the people like me who came from Jordan uh, their Palestinian citizenship. So I can't go freely from place to place. Most of the time I should stay at home with my family, but I wasn't care too much because I have my family to take care of. And our happiness become much more after one year when we have our second child, he was a boy. We named him Kosai, we love him so much. He was beautiful, intelligent boy. When he become six month old, 11th of April, 2002, our happiness was ended four o'clock in the morning when he was woke up in a very serious condition because one day before the Israeli soldiers came to our village through tear gas and he smelled some of it. At that time, uh, the treatment wasn't good enough in my village. So we tried to take him to the hospital inside Bethlehem but we face an Israeli checkpoint. They stop us and they said, you can't enter because it's a military zone. So the next chance was to take him to Hebron, the next city to Bethlehem. But again, the soldiers said to us that the main road is closed. So the last um, chance we have to take him to Hebron, but through villages and that road will be rough and long. The main road will take 20 minutes, but this road will be much more. So again, we faced another checkpoint between the villages. They stop us, they try to search the car and the ID of my husband and my father-in-law. 
uh, so my father-in-law tried to talk to them and tell them that our son in serious condition and he should be in hospital as soon as possible, but they asked him to stay in the car. A few minutes later, I was really thinking and crying. I feel hopeless. I didn't know what to do. But I then have an idea to go a risk and talk to them. And the risk is if they find that I didn't have my Palestinian ID, maybe they will send me back to Jordan or take me to jail and I will never see my children again. But at that time, I wasn't care about myself. I just care about my son and try to save him. So I went to them and tried to talk to them, but they start to laugh at me and they asked me to stay in the car. More than four hours we stuck there until we reached the hospital. So when we reached the hospital, the doctor said that if he will stay alive after 48 hours, he will be handicapped. So the two choices was hard to imagine and accept. Um, few minutes later, they take him to the intensive unit, unit care because his condition become much worse and worse. Uh, and the end of, of that day, he was died. When the doctor called us, we returned back home. And when we called the doctor and he said that he died, I felt at that moment that his word was like, a bullet to my, comes to my heart, smashing down for many pieces. I start to cry like a crazy, didn't know what to do. A uh, few minutes later, the house was full of people, neighbors, relatives, friends. But for me, I wasn't care about any one of them. I just care about my son and think of, about him. So I started to convince myself that when I came back home, I slept in the car and this is a dream. And this is not true. And next day I will go back this to the hospital, bring him back, and he will be in a good health. But unfortunately, that was the truth. So um, at that night, I was have a dream. I slept maybe for five minutes. I was very tired. So I was have a dream that there is a white dove came and sat on my shoulder and said to me, Mama, don't cry. I'm so happy. But from that moment until now, I couldn't stop crying when I think about him or speak about him. Um, next day, when they bring him back to say goodbye for him, until the moment that they put him between my arms, I was still think that maybe he is alive and they try to uh, lie. But when I take the blanket off, I was really shocked when I saw him. He was very blue. I tried to kiss him in his cheek as I always do when I hold him, but I felt like I kiss a frozen rock. So I immediately without thinking, I hug him so tight because I was believing miracles and think maybe some kind of miracle will happen and he will go back to life. But unfortunately, the only thing that happened that they take him away from me and that was the last um, minute I saw him and hug him. From that moment, my life become like upside down. Everything was changed. I start to feel the hatred, anger, sadness, all the bad emotion you could think about. But at the same time, I wasn't think of revenge because revenge will never bring anything back. And uh, I start to think about how could I protect my family and uh, myself, my husband. But at the same time, I was taking a decision not to have any kind of relationship with any Israeli person, because for me, all of them were responsible about his death. So for more than 16 years, I really didn't have any kind of relationship with anyone. Until one day, one of my friends, he called me and we started to talk about a few things. Then he started to talk about the birth circle. And I stopped him when he started to talk and said, are you crazy? I'm the last person that you should talk to him about something like that. You know what happened to my son? And he said, because I know you and I know your story, 
I told you about the borough circles. So he said to me, I want to ask you a question. Why until now you didn't tell your other children about what happened to their brother? I told him because I I don't wanna uh, I I didn't want them to be part of this cycle of violence. I didn't want to lose them. I lost one of them and that was much more than enough for me. So he said, maybe it will be a good chance for you not just to protect your children, maybe other families of other lives. In fact, in the beginning, I wasn't convinced about what he said until one day he invited me to a conference in Bethlehem. Um, in the beginning, I wasn't really want to go there, try to find excuse, but he insists when we went there. In the beginning, I find just Palestinian. We sit and talk about a few things. Then when the Israelis start to enter that room, I will stand up, try to leave the room because I start to feel something in my chest, start to acne. And I said to my friend, I don't wanna see them. And he said, please sit down and listen to them. And after that, whatever your choice will be, I will never argue with you. So when we were talking, I saw them hug and kiss each other like family members, not just as friends. And that was the first time I saw something like that. And I was thinking, oh my God, what's happening here? I wanna really sit because I wanna really know what's the thing that make them so close to each other like that. So when I listened to their personal stories and how they lost their beloved ones, I really touched because that was the first time I looked at them as a human like me, not an enemy. For the first time, I felt that we share the same pain, the same tears. And that was so moving. And I was said to my friend, I want to participate in one of the project. Please told me and I want to really be part of this because I want to know much more about the Israelis. And what's the thing that it, cha it changed those people? So I participate one of the project called Burl Narrative Project. It's about to bring uh, 30 person, 15, 15 from each side and give them a chance to sit for more. For most of them, it's the first time sit face to face with the others and listen to them and try to understand the situation. And we have two professors, one Israeli and one Palestinian who speak about the history. We went to visit the Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem to know about the Holocaust. And we went to a village that was established before 1948, before the Israeli soldiers demolished it. And for most of us, it was a shocking thing because we are lived together in this land and we didn't know about each other lives and about the history about a lot of things though it's a really good chance for us to learn and uh, to be together uh, the first activity was at that project they asked us to talk about something happened in our lives affected so it was the first time I speak about what happened to my son. And after those years, in the beginning, I was thinking it will be easy, but it was so hard. After all these years, it's like to open the wound again and bring the whole memories back and the whole emotions back. So I couldn't complete the story in the middle of it. I start to cry. And then an Israeli woman, she came and sat in front of me and she started to apologize. And when I asked her why you are apologized for, and she said, yeah, I didn't hurt you, but the people who hurt you from my own people, and I'm a mother too, I could understand your pain. I could understand even the word that you couldn't say and didn't say. And she came and hugged me and she started to cry. And I was really, really amazed because this is the first time someone could feel um, the things that even I couldn't say. He, she uh, understand everything. She could feel the real pain that I have. 
even in, in, in my family, we didn't spoke about what happened since his death. So at that time, her word was like light come from deep, um, uh, deep and dark place. Um, she didn't know that by her simple words that she changed my life again forever and for the best. Because from that moment, I decided to be a member in the forum and start to give lectures inside Israel, Palestine, around the world about peace and reconciliation. But that wasn't just the only thing that I've done during this journey. The transformation that happened to me, it was so important for me and for my family too, and for the people around me who start to realize and find that I become a new person, not the same Layla before four years. One of the things that um, helped me during this transformation and during this journey that I stopped looking to myself as a victim and I start to look to myself as a survivor. And this is so important. Um, and it's important that uh, give me a chance to forgive those people, not just because of them, even because of me, because it's so easy to go and talk to people about peace and reconciliation and all these beautiful words. But if you didn't feel it from inside, I don't think you could achieve anything or even you could spread the message in the right way. So that was really helped me to cure myself before I start to, to spread the message. And this is so important for every person who really become part of uh, the Burns Circle. And one of the most important thing that I start to have brothers and sisters and Israeli brothers and sisters, and some of them, they become much closer to me than my only family members. And one of them is, my friend and my sister, Robbie. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lila. As always, your your sharing your story is so articulate and so powerful, and uh, it certainly has taught me a lot too. Uh, Robbie, Thank over you. to you. So that's. Um... Uh, Lila was talking, I was thinking about how do you live a message of gratitude? How do you live compassion? How do you live empathy? All of these lovely words that we keep coming up in our lexicon of life. And um, I think gratitude has become something very prominent in my life lately. Gratitude for the opportunities that came my way, for the people I met, for being able to speak in a way that may touch and make a difference to others that might support them. I don't really like the word help because it makes people helpless, but the word support is a very powerful word. And sometimes if you're given the opportunity to be a catalyst, in the change of somebody else's life from anger, as was in the case of Lila, and, and um, sadness all the time and never being able to let go of, of that sense of being a victim, to be able to be a part of somebody's life and to watch a transformation is a huge gift. And so, that has come to me every day for the past couple of years. I suddenly realized how the death of my child almost opened up so many extraordinary doors and people who I've met along the way who've changed who I am from being, um, how can I put it, a rather dominating um, not difficult, but a person who was almost dictatorial and not somebody who really could share from another point that had something to do with love and compassion. So um, 
these are all words and the question is how do you take these words and turn them into something which is, becomes your day-to-day -day living? Um, and how do you commemorate the name of your child in a way that nobody will ever forget? You know, we just had an, an exhibition um, which was made during the last war where 68 children died. For what? 68 innocent children died and I promise you, nobody would even recall their names except their families. And so everybody became a number in the paper, but it's just so extraordinary how suddenly a sense of compassion came up in the hearts of 68 illustrators and they made a picture for each child that was killed for the 68 children. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, in the parent circle, we have this opportunity for, to tell the story of the person you lost and so they will not be forgotten. And so these pictures are something which is a statement that each child had a name, each child had a parent, each child lost its life and would never, and whose family would never be the same. So when the army came to tell me that David, my son, had been killed by a Palestinian sniper, it would appear that one of the first things that I said is you can't kill anybody in the name of my child. That was very prophetic of what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. I looked for an organization where I could perhaps maybe this was a little bit arrogant, but perhaps prevent other mothers, both specifically mothers in my case, Palestinian and Israeli from experiencing this pain. Um, and how could I do that? And a religious Jewish man came to see me and his name was Itzhak Frankenthal. And his son was captured and killed by uh, the Hamas. And he took a very different path he decided he would like to find a way perhaps to go towards reconciliation. And it made him very unpopular in his own, uh, in his own milieu. And thinking about that, um, you have to be very brave many times to do this work because people say terrible things and people threaten when you touch something which is the nerve of, of, of what is going on. And he created this organization, which in the beginning was more a photo op organization. For instance, they took um, a thousand cardboard coffins to America and put them outside uh, the United Nations and draped them with Israeli and Palestinian flags. And 12 members of the parent circle went together with this it's before my time, but it was extremely effective. Um, so Itzhak came to see me after he heard me speaking at a demonstration and invited me to go to the West, to East Jerusalem, to meet with Palestinian and Israeli bereaved families. And I remember sitting around the table and looking into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and recognizing that um, here was an incredible opportunity to be an example, because if I could stand on the stage together with a Palestinian uh, partner and talk in the same voice for reconciliation and nonviolence, then surely that would be an example for those who could not do that. And I, it started off really a whole, my whole life changed after that weekend. I closed my office, I started to travel all over the world. I thought I was amazingly important. And then um, because I spoke in all of these very fancy venues and who after all was I? Simply a mother that lost a child. And when I came back one night from traveling, I, there was a knock on my door and there were three soldiers outside. And actually um, the minute you see three soldiers, it only means one thing in Israel. So I slammed the door in their face and then they kept knocking and eventually I let them in. And they said, we came to tell you that we caught the man who killed your child. Thinking that I would have this huge sense of relief and revenge 
Whereas what it did, it created in me a huge question about my own integrity. You know, could I continue to do this work and not walk the talk? It's very nice to go around the world talking about peace and love and reconciliation and read bad poetry and rainbows and all of those things. But do you actually mean it? I'm not going to go into all the details, but I can tell you that eventually I wrote a letter to the family who were very shocked when they received it from two Palestinians from our group. And um, in the letter, I told them about David, my son. David was a student at Tel Aviv University and he was studying for his masters in the philosophy of education. And he was part of the peace movement and part of the student uprising. And here was this person who was in a quandary about should he go and serve in the occupied territories? And, you know, we don't know who the person is behind the gun because this kid came to talk to me and said, what shall I do? If I don't go, what happens to my students? He was teaching philosophy to kids who are gonna be inducted into the army. And if I don't go, what happens to my soldiers? Uh, he was the officer, but if I do go, I will treat people with dignity and so will all my soldiers. So here you go, you know, you don't know the black person behind the gun. You don't know the quandary of growing up in Israel and what it's like to be fed with the, the myth of the army and how much you have to provide and protect for your country. Um, I also told the family about the parent circle that we are more than 600 families who've all lost an immediate family member and that what we want in the long run, run the vision is to create a framework for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any political future peace agreement. Because without that, we can have another ceasefire until the next time. I also told the family that we needed to meet. We owed that to our children and grandchildren. And of course, the family were very shocked when they got that letter and expected, you know, they said if everybody signed on this, perhaps there would be peace. And me, not being the most patient character in the Middle East, expected to get a reply immediately. And it took three years. And in the reply, I was told that I was crazy and that I should and that he killed 10 people to free Palestine. Um, that turned me from being a victim or the victim of this circumstance into being, I don't call myself a survivor anymore, I don't like that word, into being a victim. Because there is a connotation of survivor, which isn't exactly the way that I feel. So, um, but people must choose the words that are suitable for how they feel at a particular time. And this released me, this whole letter released me from being contingent on what Thaya, that's the name of the sniper, would do. I went then to South Africa, which obviously anybody that's listening would recognize this extraordinary South African accent. Um, to make a film about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to look at how perpetrators and victors, and victims, sorry, feel today about giving evidence of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to explore the meaning, for me personally, of what is forgiving. Everybody has a different definition. It's not a prerequisite in the parent circle. You don't have to be part of forgiving. You have to be aligned to the message of nonviolence, to the message of reconciliation, and to the message of getting out of the occupied territories. Um, I wanted personally to meet a woman who had been to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and she told the people who had killed her daughter, I forgive you. And I wanted to know what she meant. And I asked her, what's your definition of forgiving? And she said, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. And the man who had sent people to kill her daughter said that by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. And for me, that's a very important statement. I can't imagine something that is more um, moving than to say, by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. 
The story goes on and I tried to meet the uh, sniper on several occasions. We have a new government now and perhaps that will work out. I don't know, um, but it isn't as pressing as it was right in the beginning. I think what is really important for people to understand is that it's not about just two people. There are 600 stories behind us. We could have 600 people talking to you and telling you how of their path to transformation. So um, when we talk about the work, the work is on the ground, both in Israel and Palestine, and it's not just for bereaved parents or bereaved families. We work with the general public. So that what Lida was telling you about, the parallel narrative program is a very important part of how we see our work because what are you teaching? If you want to teach empathy, you have to teach history in a way that each person can actually look at their history and say it as they see it. And the other side may not agree, but they certainly would listen with empathy. And that is the beginning of a conversation, is the beginning of ending all, the, all of this, I have to be right. You know, I'm right, you're right, and neither of us succeed. So, and talking about the women's group, I think it's time for women to come to the table. But I can tell you what Lila was saying is very true, is this fact that we don't know each other, which creates this huge barrier. And so going into a home in Palestine and talking to women and realizing that the only Israelis that they've ever met are either settlers or soldiers. So why would they think there's anything different? And by going into a school in Israel with a Palestinian partner and recognizing that none of these children age 17 who are about to go into the army have ever met a Palestinian in their lives. So what is all of this? This is called fear, which creates hatred, which creates violence. There are so many, I hope you will go into uh, our website of the American Friends, join our newsletter, and we travel so much extensively all over the world. Hopefully, I don't know, I hope that this COVID will, will quieten down and that people's lives, which will never be the same, but that they, we will all be able to travel and spread this message wherever we go. I think that there's not a question now. I, I just returned from a trip to the deep south in America and seeing the root of slavery and what happened and, and seeing the whole movement of civil rights, you begin to understand that everybody has this intense, painful history that has to be dealt with. So any questions that are difficult, please ask Lila, otherwise, um, Thank you very much. Marilyn, you can come back. Okay, I am, I am back. And, um, and, and I've encouraged people to, to write some questions. But, um, and I think a, a question was sparked when, with what you just said. Um, and that is, can you speak a little bit more about uh, the political structure that you have in mind that you think uh, could be used in other places in the world? Because um, I think that is so Im important. Even, even places like in, in the United States, between neighborhoods, between uh, groups of people uh, who are different than perhaps ourselves. Um, I, I'd love to hear more about that. I think one of the things, and Lila will also say what she thinks, but I think one of the things, um, this whole state of polarization wherever you go, um, and in America more and more obvious, um, I've traveled a lot to the States and this trip to the South shocked me to my core to see that there are places with 80% black people, with white people running the town as if, you know, it, it was like going back to South Africa and thinking to myself how they could do with a parallel narrative program. I, you know, we were in Montgomery and I was looking at the cemetery with the Confederate flags. 
which every American, I don't know if the Americans know the history of slavery. I don't know if they know that one out of three black people or have black men have been to jail. I don't know if they know about the 20%, 80%, but it's something that one has to acknowledge. And while there's so many museums for the Holocaust in America, but where are all the slavery museums? And this extraordinary opportunity to meet with a person like Brian Stevenson and to see a museum which he created out of so much love. It's not there to punish people, but when you understand the pain and when you start to look at how each person sees their history, I had this picture in my mind of Montgomery with the black women that I met who were so extraordinary and so joyful, you know, and trying to make a difference if they could meet with the women because I looked in the cemetery and there were so many graves that had Confederate flags on them. And I thought, why don't they meet with these women and try to create some kind of narrative project like we do? And so our work can definitely be exported to other places. I was in Sri Lanka before the COVID and um, sitting in a workshop and, and recognizing just how valuable it would have been for these people who probably had never had the opportunity to tell their story ever, suddenly had this opportunity. I mean, what is the work of the parent circle? What we are doing is making an emotional breakthrough by telling you the narrative of our story and even the hardest of hearts cannot be left without any kind of um, emotional feeling, even if they don't agree with you. But how could you listen to, to Lila's story or my story for that matter and not be moved in some way? And so there were so many stories. There was a woman sitting in the workshop with me in Sri Lanka. Sorry, once you start me talking, I can't yes. stop. Um, she was... Uh, um, she was sitting next to me and I, it was a lot of families who didn't know what had happened to their children. But I could see that she wanted to say something and I said to her, what? And she started to tell me the story. This is the first time that she's ever told the story. Why? Because she felt safe because I had told my story. And she started to tell the story of her loss. She lost her husband and her son and it was very graphic. And I suddenly thought, wow, you know, she said, this is the first time I ever told this story. Can you imagine what she had been carrying on her shoulders for all of this time? And the next day she came into the workshop and her whole face was like somebody washed it with milk. And so isn't that, I mean, and when I said to you earlier on that I'm grateful, can you imagine what it feels like when you are given this gift to be able to enable somebody else to tell their story like that. That's an incredible, that's an incredible gift I've been given to do this work and to be able to, to, uh, to watch somebody transform from hatred and anger and somebody who didn't speak for 16 years to an Israeli and didn't even speak to their family to suddenly have this ability to open their heart and understand that it doesn't work to think about vengeance because there is no revenge for a lost somebody you lost. So um, yes, absolutely. I think the work could be transported. I felt such um, an empathy together with the black women. I think that's more my South African background than anything else mm -hmm. and wanted so much, you know, to, to continue the workshops that we started. So I'm hoping we'll be able to do that and go back, you know, on a, on a trip and take some Palestinians and Israelis from our group, because for them, it may be, you know, everybody thinks their own conflict is a unique conflict that can never be solved. So sometimes you have to look at like the Irish and the Rwandans and the South Africans, and even what's happening in the South now, because there is this movement that's awakening as long as the movement doesn't create more victims, it needs to create people who are victors of the situation. And how, what do they do with their life now? And you have a choice. Everybody's got a choice how they can, what they should do with their life. Okay, Lila, I promise you I won't go on for another hour. Well, okay. Um, here's a question. 
Uh, would you speak to how you are able to avoid bereavement and work collectively to build peace within a territory that is so fraught with deep memories of conflict? I, I really think maybe I didn't understand the question correctly. So please, if you say it in. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the, the statements of, um, of the parents circle is that you don't necessarily deal uh, in bereavement, uh, but that you take uh, another position. And so, you know, how are you able to do that considering the depth of sorrow that is in each of your stories? Um, and how do, you, how do you stay focused on building peace? Um, there is, um, I don't think it's Arabic, just Arabic, everyone maybe say it, that the things that it didn't break it down, it's make us stronger. So we take the hope that we carry every day from our pain. Uh, I believe that God didn't do anything in this life for no reason. Everything happened for a reason. Like when I have that dream about a white doe came to my shoulder and said to me, mama, don't cry. Maybe at, that, at the same time, I wasn't understand what it means, right? But after I become a peace activist, I start to realize that was the way and the, the mission that God chose me to do is to be a peace activist. And the white dove is a sample for peace. So um, I, take, I take that hope from that point that, my son or what happened to my son will never go away for no reason. There's something much more important should happen. And I, I, when I look to my uh, children and the other children, even in the other side, it's so hard when, when, when I went for the first time to talk to the girls who will go to the army at the age of 17 and 18. And I really felt sorry for them, how you could think to send a child at that age with a gun in this crazy situation and you think that he will be um, a normal person. I, that was the moment I started to think, how should I forgive them? Because I could understand their fear and they will act um, like a crazy because they will be afraid to put the child at that same as once I was so uh, a soldier, his gun was taller than him. He was too, too young to have it. So I really felt sorry about them. And I started to feel maybe they are the victims. They are not me. They are the victims of the law and the government. And the governments didn't um, care about the both sides, Israel or Palestinian. The two leaders just think about what they want, not what we want, like when they want to make a peace ag uh, agreement like Oslo or when they try to make war, they will never came and ask me or ask Ruby, what's your opinion? So it's the time for us to, to work in the ground and try to, um, to work side by side because this is our lives and we should build the future for our children and our grandchildren. We don't want the leaders to, to, to do this work. It's our mission and it's our uh, needs to be, or to do the life much more um, safer for them. You know, um, Lila, what you're saying is so important when you think about the fact of the amount of influence you do have when you talk to people. Uh, about your story. I mean, those young women who uh, will put in their service uh, to their country, they're going to be going, uh, doing that work. 
having heard your story. And I, I remember um, a number of years ago, um, I directed a teacher training program and um, I thought narrative was so very important. And there was an opportunity for these young to be teachers, uh, to listen to the stories of survivors of Hiroshima and also uh, wives of American soldiers who went in uh, to Nagasaki and Hiroshima for what was called the cleanup after the dropping of the bomb. And we sat in a circle for hours and listened to the survivor stories um, and also to the women who lost their husbands because of radiation um, that, that they acquired because of the cleanup. And I know that I will never be different. Uh, I mean, I will always be different because of that story. And I know that those 30 young people who were going on to teach will always somehow bring that kind of narrative into the classroom. So I'd, I'd really like to, to thank you for that. I, I think it's something very important, Marilyn, is now there are so many thousands and thousands of bereaved families from the COVID. Mm -hmm. And so many people who could not say goodbye. Think about how terrible that is, yeah. that somebody just went away to the hospital, you couldn't say goodbye, you couldn't come and hold their hand, you couldn't have any of the ceremonies, burial ceremonies for any of the religions, and you were alone. And how do you feel about that? And personally speaking, I think that's one of the most important things that, that we are going to be facing, and we are already facing, the fact of people who lost. And, you know, I mean, looking at the work of the parent circle in many ways can be inspirational for people who lose because what it creates in them is it gets them out of bed in the morning. They don't have to agree with our uh, ideas, but say you love animals or say you're interested in teaching or whatever it is you're interested in. If that becomes a part of your life and you make change around you, that is, gives you a reason to continue, maybe in the name of your child or however you, and one of the things, um, I don't want to give people advice because who am I? I'm not there to give advice, but I do think from my own personal perspective, writing a letter to David to tell him to even say goodbye is a kind of closure and it's a gift that you may want to give to other people who are with this terrible pain and loss and with no um, closure at all. That's, thank you, thank you. That's, it, it begins the process of stirring, you know, lots of um, possibilities. And so, and this next question is one um, that I think holds a future perhaps of us working together. And uh, the question is, how is it that the Charter for Compassion and all of our partners around the world and our members um, can join in and work together uh, with you? Well, I mean, I think if you have so many members all over the world, that means many members who have many groups of people. And if those members and, and groups of people would care to listen to another message, we would be very happy to do this kind of dialogue meeting for wherever, I mean, we do normally travel, but in this case, Zoom and Gloom has its advantages. <laughs> you can actually meet with people and, and talk without having to actually travel. And I think that's going to be a lot of the work that we do in the future. Much of the work that we do on the ground uh, has had to be online lately. It's never the same because you want to have a break, you know, even in the middle of a workshop to go outside and have a cup of coffee and in the Palestinian case, mainly to have two or three cigarettes. And um, that's a way to communicate, which is totally different 
from sitting in a workshop. But if people around the world appreciate the message that we have, if you open up your, um, your knowledge to others that they can certainly be in touch with the American friends or directly with us if they are in Europe or anywhere else, we would be delighted to do dialogue meetings and, and to share some of the work that we do that could easily be imported into their country. Right. So we have just a few minutes left and, and I'm just gonna ask this of everyone. Um, would you speak uh, to the hope that you have for Palestine and Israel and for the whole world? Of course, we still have hope. Some people said to us, uh, after 25 years, you didn't achieve anything. But I said, no, we achieved so many important things. And one of the things that this organization was a thought from one man. And now we become much more than 600 families, not just members. And more than 2,000 people who didn't lose their beloved ones, but they tried to be part of this organization and try to help the others. So as we said that the road of one mile will start with one step and we will never lose hope because we know that we, we do something so important, not just for the people here in Palestine and Israel, maybe even around the world. Because I remember when, when we went to Sweden and we went once to a school and started to talk about that, I find an Iraqi girl, she came and she started to talk to me and she said, uh, the people who came from Arabic country and from Israel, when they came and sit in the same area, they start to have the same problems and the conflict, they bring the conflict from their countries to our country here. So this is will help us even to know how to act and deal with this situation in our um, countries. So I think this is one of the important things, not just here in Israel, Palestine, we try to help people anywhere. I think what Lila is really saying at the bottom line of all of this is please don't take sides. Please don't be pro-Israel, don't be pro-Palestine because all you do is import our conflict into your country and create hatred between Jews and Muslims. So if you want to be an active, member of looking for a peaceful solution, we would be delighted to have you. But if it's to take a side, please rather leave us alone. We don't want to be more, to be a catalyst for hatred. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. You're always correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Anita, do you want to, to say anything before we, well, um, I always think Ravi and Lila saying everything there is to be said about this, but I will also say one thing to add to your last question is that the work of the Parent Circle here in America has been, I, I have come to see how important it is within my, I mean, I, as an educator and I work within the Jewish community in general, and what I confront, what I am confronted with, with rigid thinking and we're all good and they're all bad, uh, kinds of thinking within the community, um, I've come to realize how this approach to, to life and to, prog to reaching an understanding and reaching this idea of peace between people, um, it, it, first of all, it's given me the language. Robbie and Lila and all of our other members have definitely given me the language to use. Um, and I think that's important that people who hear this message, we are giving them the language they need to express what can be, as Lila says about the hope, that, that the more people who hear these messages, these stories, these words will encourage others to feel confident about using those words when they are confronted with the rigid uh, thinking that so many of us uh, come across here in America, certainly within the Jewish community. Thank you for that. Well, our time is up and we are so grateful 
and I don't want it to end. So <laughs> I think that what we need to do is to figure out ways of how we can really allow a safe space um, for people within all communities, but especially perhaps using the charter as a vehicle to bring people together to, to tell their stories. And I hope that this is just the beginning. So I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank